Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to another episode of the Mo Show podcast, episode 68, with uh, someone who I can only refer to as the champ, <laughs> Saudi Arabia's first professional <laughs> boxer, Mr. Ziad Champ al mayouf Thanks for coming on the show, man. Thank you. Thank you, Mo, for giving me the opportunity and the platform. Anytime, man. You know, um, I, uh, I was at uh, King Abdullah uh, Sports City two weeks ago, three weeks ago, mm-hmm. Rage on the Red Sea. And I mean, I, I went expecting, you know, to see a good fight between Yusik and Joshua, but I went a bit early and I was treated to your fight. And you were the only Saudi on the undercard. And the old saying is, success is when preparation meets opportunity. Yeah. The opportunity of the undisputed, was it undisputed heavyweight? Uh, it was a, it was one of the big, big, was big all eyes of the world on Jeddah. One Jinda. of the biggest fights of the century. And you were ready, and you were on the undercard representing Saudi, the only Saudi uh, fighting in that. When you were announced and you came out and you were in the ring on your home land, how did you feel uh, in carrying like the weight and the support of a nation? I felt like, this is what I'm ready for, honestly, you know, uh, it's been 12 years <laughs> building up to this opportunity, to this time, you know, and it was nowhere, there's nowhere better to do it than where I did it, you know, in Saudi Arabia, in my home country, in front of my people, my dad is there watching me, my brothers, so... They must have been in tears. Yeah, they, they were they were intrigued. They didn't know what to make make of it, you know. And like so many, because the sport is, is still growing and this is where everything starts, exposure. But when, when the opportunity came, when I was standing on that ring and I just felt like even if I'm not ready, the people watching, the people cheering, they're going to get they're me ready. ready. The adrenaline was unreal. I had to work very hard to keep myself focused and to keep myself zoned in so it just felt like it was a dream I still hadn't woken up but <laughs> I had to wake up pretty quick <laughs> looking at your face you you uh you can't stop smiling when you when you remember that night I I can't until today you know I I can't believe what happened and after the, after that fight I didn't know how the knockout looked how the fight looked, no, I didn't know anything because I was in a zone, you know, you go into a whole other zone when you're fighting the day of the fight, the day before the fight, you're in a zone that takes a few days after to get out of, you know, because it's a war, really? you're preparing for a, for a war. And for me, I wasn't just preparing for a war. I said that that night I was fighting for something so much bigger than boxing. It was way more than just a, a fight. It was a fight for my people, a fight for the sport, a fight for, you know, Vision 2030, a fight for the country. So I represented so much more than boxing that night. And this is what really built the pressure. But the more the pressure builds, the better you'll do if you approach it the right way mentally. So the pressure is going to be on anyways. If you're doing very good at something, the pressure's on to do better. If you're doing very bad, the pressure's on to do better. So the pressure is going to be there anyways. How are you going to approach it is is what matters. So I can't stop smiling because, alhamdulillah, at the end, I gave the people what I've owed them because I owed them so much, so, so much after what I've seen and the support they, they've shown and given me. I just, this was the perfect way to do it, you know. It's one thing to represent on that stage and what a stage it is, intimidating as you know what. And it's another thing to win. Dude, yeah. you won. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yeah. I, I, not, not for it to come off as a surprise, but 
that guy wanted to beat you just as much as you wanted to beat him. Exactly. Exactly. You know, that's that's the thing is because I was representing so much more than boxing that night, I won so much more than just the fight. Yeah. I won the people, I won the image, I won that introduction to to professional boxing, you know. First pro fight? First pro fight. It's a professional debut. So imagine you're debuting and it's your professional debut, eight ounce gloves. Okay. When you're training for anyone who doesn't know when you're training, you're training in 14 ounce gloves. So you go down to eight ounce gloves. You're not wrapping your hands under the gloves in the fabric wrap. It's all tape and gauze. So the punches hurt. Everything hurts so bad. Even if you land a good punch, which I'll come back to later, but when you land a good punch, it hurts. So it's your professional debut. It's your first time tasting those punches in front of thousands and thousands of people in your country. You're making history, writing your own history. You're writing the country's history. You have that prince watching, this prince watching, the minister of sports watching, everybody's watching. And then, like I, like I told you before we started, I hope to be the single most accomplished individual athlete to come out of the kingdom. This is my goal. So I have to live like it before I accomplish it. You know, I have to live like it even before I start to accomplish it. So that's how I was treating myself that night. But the more the pressure's on, the better I have to perform. So if my back's against the wall, I have to move forward. I just have to approach it the right way and keep myself grounded. So it's a professional debut, but there's a funny story behind it. Because I've had three failed fights before this one. SubhanAllah. Yeah, actually. So I've had three camps before this one that I was supposed to debut. Two of them, one of them was in Mexico. I was supposed to debut in Mexico. And then two of them, the other two I was going to suppose, I was supposed to debut in Los Angeles. And then, so one of them, the opponent fell out. The other one, we couldn't find an opponent on time. All of, I'm telling you, all of those are 10, eight to 10 week camps of weight loss. And we lose a lot of weight and we sacrifice a lot. But there's nothing like what I saw that last camp before this fight. I'm in the locker room, my opponent is there, I'm there, five minutes, my outfit is on, my fight outfit is on, I'm about to walk out, I'm the next fight, I've sold over 100 tickets, everybody's outside, it was a pay-per-view, people were staying up in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, and wherever you can say, wow. and what does the opponent do? What does he do? He goes to the California State Athletic Commission, yeah. and he says, I want to declare my own drug test. I want to declare my own drug test, basically yeah, to withdraw so we, from the fight. We take a drug test the day of the fight, <laughs> but the result comes days after the fight. Okay. But he walks to them himself voluntarily, and he says, I want to declare my own drug test. I smoked weed yesterday. Was that another way to <laughs> choose not to fight you? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the state, like the commission, the boxing commission said in the... Many, many years <laughs> they've been doing it. They've never seen this done before. You know, but alhamdulillah for everything, you know, I'm, I'm never going to question what God puts in front of me or what plans he has written for me because I have to trust the process. And look, it shows now because the debut couldn't have come any better. Look at that. But three camps and each camp I've progressed further than the other in like time spent in the camp and I've experienced more without actually fighting. So it was actually, God gave me the first camp and he was like, here, experience how long a camp could be. Okay, eight, 10 weeks. Then the second camp got canceled, like before I approach the week of the fight where the opponent pulled out. Okay, here, approach, like experience how a camp could be. And then just the week of the fight is the one you don't experience. Then the, the camp, the third camp where the opponent pulled out because of a drug test, I experienced everything, everything. I experienced fight week. I experienced the weight loss. I experienced everything from the weigh-ins to the referee instructions, putting my fight outfit on, how my mental is going to be before the fight, the day before the fight. So God was like, here, experience everything, but not the fight. <laughs> and then so come this fourth camp, this debut, 
I was ready. I was ready mentally for all of it. Because the only thing left was to fight. And that I know how to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's everything else that I didn't know how to do. Especially in professional boxing. I did it in amateur boxing. But professional boxing is like, it's like tennis and ping pong. Two different games. So everything was done for a reason. And everything, I progressed minutes and minutes more and experienced more. So come a stage this big, anti Joshua versus Usyk, my debut in front of my people, Kidding me. God made sure I was ready. Alhamdulillah. And the performance talks for itself. <laughs> Isn't there a saying? There is a saying. I've read that many a times, even if it's just on Instagram, but I've read it. God's plan is the best plan. Of course, we we go through life thinking that nope, we know what's good, and obviously you know God will support us. And then when we hit a roadblock, we're like, no, God, why? I've seen it in this podcast. Really, after the first year, I was like, oh God, how am I going to keep funding this? How am I going to keep funding this? Out of my own pocket, you know, with a family, with everything that I got to do, and I got to fund the show. How am I going to do it? Be patient, keep grinding slowly. These guys came. Caffeine lab. They said, we see value in you. We'll support you. I'm like, God's plan. Yeah. God's plan. You too. Your thing was a dress rehearsal. Exactly. He made you go through everything <laughs> that you have not experienced before. And as you said, but the thing that you can do, the only thing that you can do is fight. That I'm not going to have to give you experience. You can do that. But everything until then is going to be a learning experience until you will use it when I tell you you're going to use it. Exactly, exactly. Just trust me. It's my You're right. And you said this is the debut, but to me, it doesn't feel like that. No. It feels like this is my fourth fight. Yeah. Because I've been through, you know, gruesome camps. Yeah. If you don't know, like my story, I trained with a Hall of Fame coach, Buddy McGirt in LA. He's a Hall of Fame fighter and a coach. Who's he coached? He was, he's coached, uh, you know, Arturo Gatti. I do. He's coached Gatti in all of his Mickey Ward fights. Oh, wow. He's coached, he now coaches Kovalev. He coaches Callum Smith. Callum Smith fought on the card as well. Mm -hmm. Coached Kovalev, coached many, many fighters. But as a fighter, he's also a two-time world champion in two different weight divisions. So all that builds up to when he has a gym and it's in LA. And LA is known as the hub of boxing in the US, especially the hub of sparring. Venice? Uh, no, no, it's in the valley. Have you seen the documentary or the Netflix uh, Kingdom? No. You didn't see it? No, I didn't. <laughs> Sorry to take a, an interjection. <laughs> da, da. Um, I'll send you the, the how it was. It's more UFC than boxing. Mm -hmm. They did, I think, two seasons wow. called Kingdom. Yeah. And it gave me a front row seat to what the UFC uh behind the stage looks like before you make it to that you gotta you know train out of this gym and when they think you're ready enough then you can apply for ufc mm -hmm. it's called kingdom i'll send you the hud i think you'll very very much appreciate it because it's martial arts in la and i think you can relate to it yeah definitely definitely back to what you were saying in the valley that's where you've yeah that's where i train and that's where the sparring is insane are you, you... going against americans and mexicans like some I'm of the best against... in the f business i'm going against anyone you could think of and i'm going against olympic medalists i'm going against olympians i'm going against former world champions i'm going against number one ranked in F the u.s fighters yeah i'm going against fighters and the thing is that when i first came to the u.s from where i was raised you know i was raised between here and egypt uh when i first came to the u.s I had to start from the beginning. It felt like I was starting from the beginning because the level is very different, unfortunately. But it's the truth because we need the first solution to a problem is to know that there is a problem. The level is very different. So when I came to the US, it's like I was just starting. And so every time I'd spar, I'd get beat up. I'd get beat up very bad. I've had my nose cauterized twice. Cauterized means like to make it stop bleeding so much you know got way too sensitive from taking so many punches wow. <laughs> so by the way it looks straight to me yeah well, it's not <laughs> you know so i've i've like i've went through so many sparring sessions before i could even say i put up a good fight with that person 
I've went through so many years of just getting beat up and coming back again, getting beat up and coming back again, broken hands, broken ribs, broken anything. I've And I just kept coming back because the thing about whatever you're trying to achieve in life, if it's in sports, outside of sports, whatever it is, if you stay on the road, no matter what, run it, walk it, crawl it, if you just stay on it, there is no way you won't make it. Because the only way you won't make it is if you quit, if you if you stop, if you stop walking, you know, if you stop continuing that race. But if you stay on it, if you keep on it, everyone will eventually, you know, forfeit. Everyone will eventually just take their place out what and happens, quit. Which is what happens. Yeah. So, but if you keep going, you will make it. It doesn't matter what's happening to you with experience you get better with time you get better this is this is like physics you know it's it can't not happen with time you will get better with experience it will get easier so ultimately and eventually you will be as good as the fighters that i was trying to get to so the secret was to work twice and three times as hard as they are just to be at the same level Hard work beats talent any day. Exactly. But imagine you have to work twice and three times as hard as someone else Mm. just to be as good. Just to be as good. Not even to be better. Yeah. (laughs) Just to be as good. As good. Yeah. So it it's just for me personally, this was way more of a mental journey than a physical journey. I want to get into the mental side of it in a second. Um, but before I do I want to ask you, has it reached a point of obsession? If I wasn't obsessed, I wouldn't still be here, (laughs) you know, but... You're obsessed. But obsessed with what? With wanting to be the best fighter that Ziad can be. So with that, there's, there's there's a little obsession of wanting to be the best fighter. A little obsession of wanting to be a boxer. But then the obsession comes really in making my family proud Mm. the obsession comes in making my country proud making the people that are watching proud and then you have to be obsessed with you know just being an inspiration so just be obsessed with inspiring others and having others look up to you that's the feeling you have to live for so of course to accomplish all that you have to be the best you know, but the best fighter is what? You know, a fighter is the battles that he faces outside of the ring, not inside. And the best boxer is, come. it comes from the results. But it doesn't come from the results of your fights. It comes from the results of how you deal after, you know, the fight. After you lost, how do you deal with it? That's the result. After you won, how do you deal with it? That's the result. Sports aside, you got a job. How do you deal with it now? Are you going to push harder or or are you going to relax because you finally got the job? You didn't get the job that you've always wanted. Are you going to give up or are you going to keep going? These are the results. So these are this is the obsession that you have to be worried about and like thinking about. This is the obsession you have to be thinking about because this is what will get you there. So you have to be doing it for much more than just yourself because the journey is going to require way more and demand way more out of you that if you're doing just for yourself you're not going to make it you have to have so many whys and so many reasons and so many people you're doing it for so when one day (laughs) one of them is not there there's another that's what you have to be really obsessed with making everybody proud making yourself happy making others happy making your parents live comfortably you know, making them just satisfied with what you're doing because if they're not satisfied with what you're doing, you're not doing something right, you know? What have you done outside of the ring that has helped you perform inside the ring? The biggest part of my team, and I mean it when I say it, the biggest part of my team for me for this journey because I faced much more outside of the ring than inside is my mental performance coach. Having a mental performance coach, I think I was ahead of other athletes around me where when others would give up and quit, 
I had a mental performance coach that always had my mentality right. So approaching this fight, imagine what was going on in my head. Imagine the pressure, the the doubt, the fears sometime. Probably wake up in the middle of the night, sweats. You don't have to wake up because you didn't get any sleep. You didn't even get any sleep. No. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, but who's going to help you through this? Someone professional and who knows a lot about it. So my mental performance coach is is for athletes mm. and he's just seen it and dealt with it and he's been there done that and he's the guy that i go for for all this stuff and he's arab so he understands when i say i'm doing it for my parents i'm doing it for my family you know he comes from the same culture comes from the same background so he can relate on so many levels and he knows that i'm writing history and there's so much history yet to be written that I want to write. It's an empty book. You know, exactly. Yeah. For this sport yeah. in Saudi Arabia, in the Arab world. So he, he has my mentality right. Mm -hmm. So this is what I needed because he controls my doubts, turns it into motivation. My fears eliminates them, makes me control them and use them to my advantage. And then all that aside, he just adds and adds to my arsenal of my mentality. I know when I'm feeling a specific way, what I'm supposed to do. And when I'm feeling another way, what I'm supposed to do to use it to my advantage. So that's what I'm telling you. The reason, the, the whole idea about pressure is going to be there anyways. And you either choose two roads to walk with it and embrace it or to let it control you and rule you, you know, and then you're not going to enjoy the process. True. The fight is going to be over, even if I won. And fight week was so mentally bearing on me and mentally just destroying me. Even if I won the fight, would I look back and enjoy it as much as if I controlled my mentality during fight week? I slept good. I was happy. I was visualizing my win, meditating and doing all that. So it's two different, two different journeys. And he helped me walk the right one was the fact that it was the first, like second fight, inshallah, maybe a little bit more sleep beforehand, maybe less speaking to yourself. The first one, it's, uh, you want to get that first one under your belt. Yeah, definitely. You know what? But the, the thing is, after you get a first fight like that and a win like that, you're done and you say the next one has to be as good, if not better. <laughs> and then the next one has to be, if not as good, better. So you're always looking to just, keep that momentum and you know you have to be accepting to taking losses in life and taking losses in the sport at the end of the day it's a sport you're gonna have your bad day your good day it's gonna happen but like i said the result is how you react when it happens yeah. either if it's a win or a lose you know a win or a loss you have to you have to be able to control your mentality in both and keep your momentum going so the next fight, yeah, of course, I'm going to be more experienced. I know that the people now saw what I've got. They know how I can perform. They know that I'm not just a name, not just a show, you know. So you made a name for yourself. Alhamdulillah, you know, so it's not me. It's, it's all God. I just show up. I just do the work. And then like we always say in boxing camp, the work is done. And then fight night is just a reflection of how hard you worked in camp. That's it. It's crazy. If you worked hard in camp, you're going to win the fight. You didn't work hard in camp, you're going to lose the fight. That's just how it is. You can't have a very, very lazy and bad camp and go and win the fight. Doesn't it's not going to happen. Way, yeah. Boxing and combat sports is very different. That's why when we weigh in, when we're done with the weigh-ins, they say the hard work is done. The hard part is done now. Because the fight is the easy part. Because you've worked so hard in camp. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, at what age, or let's say, when did you know that you were good? When did I know I was good at when the sport? Did, when did you know that you were good? And 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 be very honest. And I and I will accept an answer like, uh, you know, this guy was hitting on my girlfriend, and I realized that I can box. <laughs> <laughs> when did you actually, you know, tell yourself or your boys told you, God damn, yeah, you could box, man? So when I moved to the U.S. I moved to the US when I was already nine years into the sport. But when I was already training back home, you know, where I was raised, when I was already training there, I just always thought that I know what I want. This isn't the level that I want to compete in. 
and this isn't the level that the results from are going to show me if I'm good or not. So I always knew the, the results are how I'm going to perform in the US. How am I going to, if I, if I start winning when I perform in the US, when I, if I start winning, you know, and performing better in the sparring around the champions in the US, that's when I know I'm good. Because I always thought when I was back in Saudi or Egypt, I always thought to myself, there must be more than that. There must be more to the sport. We've heard of continental champions. We've heard of local champions. But we haven't heard of the international champions. We haven't heard of the global champions. I want to do that. So because there is so much history to be written in the sport for Saudi Arabia and for the Arab world, that's what's kept me going. Because that's a huge purpose in it. You know, that's a lot of, that's just history presenting itself to me. And it's like, here you go, R write it. <laughs> so how can I say no? You know, so that's what I knew. And then there's a funny story because the first fight I had in the US, I was like, okay, this is it. If I win this fight, I'm good. If I lose this fight, I don't think I'll do it. Whether you have it or not. That yeah. was the determining <laughs> yeah. night. I, I was like, to me then, yeah. that was what will determine, determine if I'm actually good. And I lost the fight. <laughs> you, lo you lost the fight. I lost the fight. I lost my first fight, my first amateur fight in the US. I lost. It was a very good fight between me and my opponent. Close. It could have went either way. But they gave it to him. But because I'm so used to taking losses, not just in boxing, but in life. I'm so used to taking losses and coming back and coming back again and coming back again that this was nothing. Mm -hmm. I knew that I could I could do it. I knew that I could get better because like I said, all I have to do is work harder than everyone around me to be as good, but eventually they won't catch up to me. So I'll be better eventually. So I kept coming back and working, kept coming back and working. I started winning the fights and winning and winning and gaining that amateur experience until it was time to work with the pros. You're a pro now, yeah? Yeah, right now, professional professional boxer. Like I said, two different games. If you're a good amateur, it doesn't mean you're going to be a good pro. If you're a bad amateur, it doesn't mean you're going to be a bad pro. It's tennis and ping pong. One is faster, bigger gloves, you know, and it's about the points. And the other one is about knocking you out, hurting you, you know, taking your head off honestly, and the weight loss is very different. Amateurs don't lose that much weight. So amateurs could lose three, four kilograms for a tournament. But in professional boxing, for this camp, I lost 11, 12 kilograms. That's how we do it. Are so, you still at that 11? No, now I'm not because I fought at 62 kilograms. Okay, what so are you I normally, 70s, <laughs> yeah, 71? Yeah, I'm, I'm normally 73, 74. That's what I You went around. down to 62? Yeah, that's that's just that's not just me, but everyone in professional boxing, that's how we do it. We drop 15 to 20 pounds when camp starts. We have eight to 10 weeks to do it. So what do you do? Like, are you on juice diets? No, you're on you're on just the calorie deficit. Calorie deficit. <laughs> yeah, huh? you're on a calorie just, deficit. That's the sparring, the bagging, like the whatever. Yeah, so you're you're on a calorie deficit. You know, if like for example, I get eighteen hundred calories a day, mm. and then your protein intake has to be very high through the roof. You know, there are of course calculations. You know, you can't do this without a nutritionist. Mm. My advice to anyone <laughs> going into the sport: do not do this without a nutritionist. So my nutritionist has me right, you know, my protein intake is good. My deficit is good enough. What are you burning on a daily? Seven, eight? I have no idea. No, of course not. Not but, that much. Yeah, but it's like you know, marathon, marathonists. But you have you have 60 days about you have 60 or 70 days to drop 11 or 12 kilograms. It's doable. It's not a long term thing because that's what we do. Like this is just how we this is the sport. It's part of it. But to me, honestly, I get paid to weigh in. Hmm. I don't get paid to fight. Interesting. Because the fighting I enjoy. <laughs> I can do I can do for free. The first part you don't. But the, the weight loss, I hate with all my heart. Really? <laughs> I hate the weight loss. If something's going to make me retire early from the sport, <laughs> it's the weight loss. And, and in short, why? Because you're on a negative energy balance. Okay. All right. So mood swings. Yeah. Mood swings. Patience. You're easily irritated. 
So that kind of sometimes goes out on the people you care about. It goes out on your parents, on your siblings. They have to put up with. Yeah, they have to they have to put up with all that. And you know in this sport you sacrifice so much because you're training twice and three times a day mm-hmm. while you're losing weight. So you're on a calorie deficit. The weekend comes, you can't go out, you can't eat out because you have to be on your on your diet plan you have to be on your meal pl- your meal plan and you cannot you know you can't even waste a day going to eat out it's, you you don't have one day it's calculated by the hour training camp yeah camp no. is calculated by the minute zero I, cheat meals zero cheat meals okay for 10 to 12 weeks dude so say right now you're at work And you've had a very bad day, very bad day. What are you going to do? You're going to say, you know what? I'm going to go out and see some friends. For us, we can't go out and see some friends because we have to be training all day, one. And two, you're very easily irritated. So you're not taking the jokes. (laughs) You're not taking all of that. And you don't want to exert more energy because you'll get more hungry. But what about if you say, you know what? I'm going to eat out today. That's what I want to do. Yeah. You can't do that because you have to be on your meal plan. Or stress eat. Yeah, exactly. Stress eating. You can't do that. So Once in a while, you want an, you, exactly. you want a pizza, don't it, you? It, you want it all the time, you not once something. in a while. You want the <laughs> kharouf with rice. Yeah, exactly. So, But you can't. You really just can't. And it's, it's pretty tough. You know, camp takes a toll on, on your body physically. And even more mentally right. yeah. because of the stuff you have to sacrifice. I see what you have to negotiate with yourself, by the way. I'm starting to I mean, learn a little bit more about the boxing world. And yeah. not, not easy. Especially professional boxing. But because, Just, you know, single player sports, yeah. boxing, tennis, golf. I think that requires the strongest, you know, mental clarity, mental health. Because you don't have someone. Okay, you do, you know, after three minutes, you go to your corner and, the, mm-hmm. and your coach is lifting you up. But in battle... You don't have someone next to you by your shoulder. You exactly. have your opponent in the ref. Exactly. It's and you. I always said football yeah. is easier because you have 10 guys on the field with you to lift you up. Rugby, you have 14 guys on the field. Basketball, you have four guys on the in boxing, tennis, golf. It's just you in battle. It's a one-man sport or a one-person sport, let's say. And, and, it, and, and already it puts it in the tier of the hardest sports out there mentally. Exactly. 100% because in team sports, no disrespect. No, no, no. <laughs> but, we'll call it facts. Yeah, I'm facts. But in team sports, you could individually have a bad performance and your team would still win. Yeah. But mm. in individual sports, yeah. your bad performance loss. Interesting. is gone. Interesting. All that aside, though, individual sports is one thing and boxing and combat sports is another, another thing. Because if you have a bad day in tennis or in squash or whatever it is if you have a a bad moment you lose a point if you have a bad day you'll get scored on but in boxing you have a bad minute focus second you're getting punched you have a bad second you're going to sleep you have a bad day not only are you losing not only are you getting scored on points but you're getting punched in the face could lead to a knockout and listen some punches especially with eight ounce gloves and even in sparring with pros especially because the game is so different the demand is different from the from the fighters like i said one fights to get points and the other fights to hurt you so in professional boxing they really they're they're really out there to hurt you there there are no friends when you're in that ring some some punches when you take it to the right side of the temple your left leg goes numb Come on. No, I, I swear. You take it to the left side of the temple, your right leg goes numb. It's correlated. There's... All, and all of that happens while you're fighting. So imagine right now I'm fighting. I take a good punch to my head. My right leg goes numb. But I still have to keep fighting and focus because if I take another one, I'm getting knocked out. You've experienced, you've experienced this. Many, many times. This is now. I had no a idea this was even a thing. No, this is nothing. Some, You know the punches, some, some other punches you take and you see like flash you see like it's like a camera flash you know and you have to wake up from it so fast because by the time you wake up from it another punch is coming oh my god 
Your opponent knows when you're hurt. You know what I mean? He knows when he smells blood. That's probably, yeah, yeah. So once you take a punch and you see the light, you have to stay focused because another punch is coming. Some punches you take and you get dizzy and you don't feed your legs. But what makes you so ready for these moments is your camp. <laughs> How hard was your sparring in camp? How hard was your strength and conditioning? How strong are you? And how mentally ready are you that when you take a punch like that during the fight, you say to yourself, been there. I'm not going down. Mm. And I've been like, my body's ready for it. Mm. And even if you do go down, the fight isn't over. And that's something my mental performance coach brought to me. So if you realize, if you watch back my fight, my opponent, I knocked him down before I knocked him out. So I knocked him down once. When I came back out, I fought like nothing happened. I didn't get too hyped. I didn't start swinging at him with every punch I have to get him out of there. No, I knew that not because I dropped him, the fight is over. Very, That's what, very difficult to keep a cool head and not celebrate it prematurely. Yeah. Very difficult. Especially when it's your pro your debut. Home, your, and, <laughs> and in front of your home crowd. In front of thousands of people. You've exactly. got you've got uh, ATF, Prince yeah. Abdelaziz bin Turkey watching you. <laughs> exactly. you want, like, so, and God knows how many other people. So you want to make them proud. Yeah. So you know... You have to stay calm because there are two ways to do it. So it's either I knock him down and once he's up, I go swinging with every punch and I gas myself out. But that's a fighter that's not mentally prepared. I see that a lot. But a fighter who's visualized his fight so many times. So mental. And he's prepared mentally for the fight that he knows that if he goes down or if his opponent goes down and he gets back up, mm. the fight is not over. Mm -hmm. And this is true in boxing and in life. So I go out. And I know that I have to stay calm. The fight isn't over. The kid isn't hurt. I know I've got him. I smell the blood. But I know for sure that if I'm calm, I could land a better punch again to hurt him again than I could land if I'm overhyped. And that's what happened. But it's a, it's a tough, tough sport. You have to sacrifice so much, especially f for me. I'm not like the fighters who've been born and raised and bred and trained in the US and the UK with all the equipment facilities and the facilities yeah. and the boxing culture, the, the sport being so big. History. Exactly. Just, yeah. You have so many people to look up to, so yeah. many people to build upon. I'm not like that. I came from, you know, no equipment, not nothing close to the equipment they have. I had heavy bags that you can't even punch on. And I didn't have a ring for the first four years, five years I was training. And when we got a ring where we were training, it was all torn apart with time. And we replaced it with like gym floor weightlifting mats. And we didn't have enough for the whole ring. So it was spaced out. So you trip and you twist your ankle and you'd fall. So you would have to worry about being knocked down, not by just your opponent, but by also the ring. So it's a good, good training mechanism. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I've those come, are the conditions you yeah, have to train it. Yeah, yeah. So doesn't matter where, what family you've come from, how much money you had, the opportunity. Do not ever compare the opportunity that the fighters in the U.S., U.K., Mexico, all of these had to the Arab world. Yeah. So the we could have the money, we could have the name, but. We didn't have the, you know, the importance of for that sport. So the opportunities that I was given were nowhere near to the opportunities that these people were given. Yeah. And then the level of training, coaches, and IQ of the sport is very different just because of the level of exposure being so different. So imagine this. Every single time I walk into a gym, Every single time I'm about to spar with anyone, I know for a fact they have more experience than me. They've been training in better equipment than me. They've been around better coaches and better fighters than me. And I still have to lead myself to win. And I still, and I still have to lead myself to perform, outperform. And I still have to work harder than them. So just imagine the mental barrier you're facing when you know for a fact Someone in front of you who you're about to fight, who wants to take your head off, and you want to take his head off, but you know for a fact he has more experience. 
He has better experience, better equipment than everything. And you have to still convince yourself that you're going to do it. So we're, we're bred very different in the Arab world. They don't know, but they will know. But we're bred very, very different because we're, we're hard, hard workers. Good difference. Yeah. It's funny because yeah. last episode I was speaking to an entrepreneur and she was voicing the same kind of concerns you were, but in the business world. And I said to her what I'm about to say to you now, which الكل, it's something that can be placed on all areas or ventures of life, which is hard times, strong people, good life. But right, right now, let's just concentrate on the first two. Hard times, mm -hmm. the facilities, mm -hmm. strong people. I think that's why you won your first pro fight. I think that's why I've made it to my first pro Even fight. making it just two, huh? Yeah. yeah, even making it two. Alhamdulillah, you know, again, where was, where, I, I don't want to say me and I because it's all Allah at the end of the day. But, Love that. you know, this is, this, is, this is how it is. You know, you know how it is. You know, like I say, it's always, I just show up and Allah does the rest. Yeah. And even in that fight, some stuff happened by itself. Some stuff happened that night. I'm telling you right now, I don't care what people would think of that, but some stuff that fight in those minutes happened by itself. And I said in the press conference too, in front of everyone, I said, if I was writing my own story, it wouldn't have been as good as God is writing it for me right now. So you're right. Tough times create tough people, but you know, you have to just keep on it. But the best thing, you know, that happens and the best thing that's going to lead you to succeeding in anything is knowing that life peaks when you stop worrying about what other people think, especially about you. <laughs> that's when life peaks. So true. You honestly just speak in life when you start. I'm going to stop talking in this episode. I just <laughs> love hearing you speak. No, uh, you, you echo what I, I hear in like all it's these. It's the truth because that's that like me and you would know about this because <laughs> you're pursuing what you want to do and I'm pursuing what I want to do. But what has really ultimately led us there is knowing that we don't care about what people think. We don't care about what others think unless, of course, you have an emotional attach them, attachment to them or you care about them so much, of course you will. Don't get me wrong. You know, your parents, of course, this was, this will always like be in the back of your mind and haunt you. But, but once you stop caring about what other people think, what other people think, your life peaks and you start doing what you want to do. Posting what you want to post, talking about what you want to talk about, pursuing what you want to pursue. So what? So what if your friend from second grade <laughs> thinks that you're going to fail or thinks that what you're doing is so lame? So what? What Like for me personally, so what if someone thinks I'm not going to make it? Are you going to be in there fighting with me? Like that night, are you fighting with me or what are you, what are you doing for me? You know? What kind of support um, or help did you get from the ministry of sports obviously they were you know behind uh rage on the red sea but you personally like when were you first reached out to by the ministry of sports and when did they recognize you as the face of saudi boxing well uh it all started during COVID, because i was still adapting and getting used to the amateurs in the u.s and trying to be as good as they are, you know, like I said, working twice as hard to be as good as they are. Then COVID shut down amateur boxing before I could even get close to as good as they are. So in COVID, what happened is, and it happened to everyone, is you were given two choices, either to stop and slow down while the whole world stopped and is slowing down, or you will, you were given the other choice of putting your foot on the gas pedal and working. This is your time to work and to catch up on the time that you need to make up and the experience that you lack. So that was my time to catch up. So I had a garage where I set up some equipment. I put all my savings into that garage, bought some bags and it was a place that me and my coach shared and we just set up the whole place and we stayed four or five months in that garage training and training and training. And so I had my brother and my cousin with me. And so when I'd sit down at night, 
we'd be watching some some stuff and sometimes I'd be watching some fights and they'd watch with me. And I just thought to myself, I was like, we just found out that the Tokyo Olympics were postponed. I said, I want to do that. I want to represent Saudi at the Olympics. No one's ever done it. I want to do it. I want to be that person. You know, I, I look for the history and I'm trying to go there. And so I told them I want to do that. So we started reaching out to people, sending messages to the federation, the boxing federation. But by the way, that was 2019. Year before. So, yeah, so you're talking about there was no that reform of the federation, reform of like sports in Saudi. So I was trying to do something where the federation wasn't really ready for it yet. But I didn't care because I wasn't going to lose anything from sending my message out there. So I kept DMing and sending my messages and sending my messages. My brother and my cousin helped me out. They would send messages too. And then all of a sudden I fell on an account of a very important person. And honestly, is the person of why I'm sitting with you here today talking about my debut on that card. Prince Abdelaziz. It, well, Prince Abdelaziz, of course, is a huge part. But the person who I DM'd is Rosh Al Khamis. Rosh Al Khamis is now she's the vice president of the Boxing Federation okay. in Saudi. But then she wasn't. Then she was just a very, very passionate person about boxing. She just loved the sport and she was looking for the star who would be the face of boxing for Saudi Arabia and maybe the Arab world, you know? So she, she, we, we sent her one of my videos and it was my cousin that sent her the video. And she replied, she was like, is that you? She was the only one that replied out of everyone, everyone. You just, you know, some of the social media accounts aren't actually run by the people themselves. So she replied, she was like, is that you? And my cousin was like, no, no, that's actually my cousin. And he wants to represent Saudi Arabia at the Tokyo Olympics since it was postponed for a year. She was like, send me the rest of the videos, connect me with him. And she was on it like hot water. <laughs> she was on it completely. She, she helped me out with everything. She connected me to Prince Khalid. She connected me and got my message out there to Prince Abdelaziz bin Turkey. She, she got me there, you know. What she, a legend. Yeah, she, she saw something in me before many people did. And she just pushed my message and pushed my story out there just based on how hard I'm working. Mm. She didn't see any fights. She didn't ask about any fights. Didn't ask about the results of any fights. She just knew how hard I'm working where I'm training, who I'm training with, of course. You know, she didn't just guess. She knew that I was around the right people. I have the right team. And she pushed my messages out there. And so little by little, it just started building and building. I kept pushing to represent Saudi at the Olympics, pushing and pushing. And I was getting there. And I was very close. I got there. And then the Olympics, the Olympic Committee decided that they are going to cancel the last chance qualifiers to, due to COVID, which, you know, <laughs> it's just very political. It is. Amateur boxing is very political. So they knew the countries they wanted to qualify. They knew the country that the countries that they don't want to qualify. That's how amateur boxing is. So they decided to cancel the last chance qualifiers and they said we'd reallocate the rest of the places based on points gathered from your amateur career since 2017. I didn't have any international amateur career <laughs> to gather points from. So that was a dream that after a year of working for and a month away from the qualifiers, it was gone. But Rosh Al Khamis is the one that got me to Prince Khalid, Prince Fahad and Prince Abdaziz bin Turk, you know, it's 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 even crazy to just be seeing, you know, it's even crazy to just be saying these names right now and talking about them and say that I've been connected to them, that I've talked to them. I've had conversations with these people. Prince Abdelaziz is someone that, you know, I honestly do admire. Before 
I knew about me fighting on that fight, you know, fighting on that card for anything because, and now that I fought on the card, I know more. But he's a person I admire. Of course, his Royal Highness Prince Abdul Aziz and Crown Prince, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, you know, they are a duo, <laughs> the dream team, they you are know, a duo. they honestly are a duo that <laughs> are just cool. breaking grounds and breaking grounds. And they've just trusted the youth and the athletes to empower the 2030 vision. The athletes made them proud. Exactly, exactly. But it all starts with the empowerment. Yeah. It, all tr- it all starts with the trust. So the crown prince and Prince Abdul Aziz trusted the athletes and the youth to do it without really having the history of the results. No history. There was no history. Just football, soccer. Yeah, exactly. That's all exactly. we need. Exactly. So, but they trusted and they empowered and they gave the opportunities and they just gave the facilities, the equipment, and they turned the red light into a green light. And that's where everything changed. It's funny that you use the word empowered because if I go back to Sahib Sun Malik Kirim Abdul Aziz bin Turkil Faisal's episode, I would see or hear that he used that word maybe over a dozen times. It's a word that's very close to his heart. Yeah. Like, on many questions that I asked, I'm like, you know, with with your focus on female athletes in Saudi, you know, what made you guys decide to focus on them and push? And then he's like, it's empowering. It's it's like it, it's a it's a word that he exercises a lot and, yeah. and that he lives by. Yeah. And here it is, you, the athlete, echoing really something that's just stapled in, in his mind. They They've given us the platform. And once they've given us the platform, we, we're ready. You know, so that we were ready, we were eager. And that's why I said they don't know that the Arab world is bred different. Because when you have your foot on the tiger's neck (laughs) for so long, once you take your foot off, we're coming for everything. And that's why Saudi Arabia today... Everything. Yeah, that's why Saudi Arabia today is the fastest growing economy in the world. And His Royal Highness Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and His Royal Highness... Prince Abdelaziz bin Turk al so they're the ones that are really pushing and pushing, you know, drastically for it. But here's the thing. There's a very smart approach of what we're doing here. Sport is a comfort to all. So anyone coming, so to attract tourism through sports is very smart because it instantly makes someone comfortable wherever they're going. So when you have AJ and Usyk happening, the people coming from Britain to watch the fight, they already know for sure that regardless of what happens in Saudi Arabia, because they've been hearing so much and so many weird opinions and different wrong opinions, but regardless of that, they've been hearing so much, so they could be worried, but they know that regardless of all that, I've, I've been to a boxing match before. You know, I've been to a fight before. This is my comfort. So I know what's happening there at yeah. least. Yeah. Formula One. Anyone who's worried about visiting, they know that at least there's a piece of comfort. Yeah. So the the hesitation falls back <laughs> drastically. And it's once you come, yeah. exactly. And once you come, and you instantly are drawn to a comfort and something you're used to, the place becomes something you're used to and something you're comfortable yeah. in. Yeah. So like tourism event. through sports is amazing, mm. and attracting tourism through athletes is amazing too that's why i want that's why i'm telling you i'm really pushing this career and pushing this story because like i said i really do believe that inshallah i could be the single most accomplished individual athlete to come out of the kingdom not because of what i do in boxing or how i win my fights but because of what i'm going to represent outside of boxing and what I'm going to represent outside of my fights. I'm representing Saudi Arabia. And I'm representing the Ministry of Sports. I'm representing Crown Pri- His Royal Highness Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and King Salman. I'm representing so many people. And I'm representing just the image to the people abroad. Because here you have an individual athlete who can speak English and Arabic and 
some things they think we can't do for some reason, <laughs> you know. I heard it all. Yeah, I've heard so many things. So now you've 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 seen that we do have fighters, we do have individual athletes. We can speak, we have charisma, we can perform, and we can accomplish at the highest level. Yeah, at the highest level and very fast, you know, because we have the right backing and empowerment behind us. But we could do it very fast. So the more people could relate to us, you know, through athletes, so they could relate through the sport, and then they become comfortable in the sport, in the country, and to the athletes mm -hmm. because we're people. So they become comfort, comfort, you know, they find comfort in people. So, you know, the planning that goes behind <laughs> Vision 2030 yeah, is you can't amazing. It. It's, it's crazy. And, and no just... matter how many times you try or how deep you try to dissect it, it you won't get you it. Won't, you won't. <laughs> and that's just one yeah. pillar, sports. Exactly. One pillar. Okay, there's like a dozen others. Exactly, exactly. I'm going to throw a bunch of words at you, okay? And I just want to know your reaction to them or what your relationship is with that word. Okay? <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. fear an illusion it's an illusion yeah it's not real no it could be you could make it real if you want to it's only as real as you make it that's what fear is fear is as real as you make it and only that you could use it to your advantage you have to use it to your advantage because if you don't you will give it the freedom to destroy you and break you down so fear is an illusion no fear is just a feeling that you need to try to control you need to control not try because once you control it the the balls in your court <laughs> it was franklin d roosevelt who said the only thing we have to fear is fear itself exactly uh that's one of the most famous quotes like like a top 10 famous quotes of all time yeah that's why when we're talking about fear i'm not saying you have to try to control it. i'm saying you need to because if you don't, it's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So, second word. Doubt. Part of the journey. And the more you expect something, the less it will shock you when it comes. So you need to expect doubt. You need to welcome it. You need to accept it. So when it comes, when that feeling creeps in, you know, you know it's normal. It's going to creep in. You've been expecting doubt to, to creep in, especially when you're about to perform. So you're going to know how to deal with it. You're going to go back to your preparation and all that. Going into the ring on August 20th, was that word in your mind? No. Zero. In the dressing room. See, that's where, the, uh, <laughs> that's, where, that's where it's different. I got it. In the dressing room, yeah, it was in my mind. But I've been, I, I'm expecting it. Of course, it's going to be there. Pressure and doubt are going to be there. But because I expect it when it came, it didn't really do anything. It's just a feeling that I'm going to have to roll with, emotions that I'm going to have to roll with. But once I step out of the dressing room, that's it. I'm in a zone. When? Right now, perform. Perform. Because I'm so confident in my preparation, I know that perform means win. So the only thing in my mind is perform. If the thing in my mind is win, 
that's pressure and doubt. You know what I mean? Wow. But if <laughs> the only thing in my mind is perform, that's me knowing that pressure and doubt is there, but I've controlled it. So I, I, walk I out. see now why you have hired a mental coach. <laughs> yeah, you need <laughs> you need to be steps ahead. So much happens <laughs> outside of the ring, huh? Yeah. No, it, the ring is the tip of the iceberg. The ring the ring is the easy part. The ring and the fight is the easy part. As a fan, all I see is the ring. Yeah, exactly. I followed AJ for a long time. Exactly. I was older when I followed AJ yeah. Tyson. I didn't know much about it, but yeah, like, and little did I know that there's so much behind the scenes. And and, and when he yeah. lost, I don't blame the guy for reacting either. the way he did, man. I That's heart. Either. Yeah, he was yeah. pissed. Yeah, honestly, look, that time when he vent like the venting after the fight, I don't blame him. Human. But I do blame the people around him. people around him. Yeah, where are the where are the friends that you? so-called brothers mm. where are the people that have been with you since the beginning pull you away man pull you away take the mic away let's go aj not like that aj yeah. you know that's when you need the most he reacted as a human would man. but yeah you me exactly. whatever like exactly you're, he wanted that shit exactly he wanted that so much anyone would because anyone would, you don't know what he's been through i'm telling you we go through a lot some sparring sessions you lose something physically that you don't ever get back. Yeah. Some fights, you lose some stuff that you don't get back, not only physically, but mentally. Yeah. But then imagine in camp, in fight camp, in an eight or 12 week fight camp, you have to deal with all those mental barriers and mental struggles while your body sore every day of the week and you're losing weight. So you're not mentally in the right place, but you need to find it deep in you to be in the right place. You're not mentally there. You know, it's so hard to be positive because you're on a calorie deficit. Calorie deficit means negative energy balance, negative energy. You're on that. But you need to find a way to embrace, enjoy and be positive when every signal in your body is telling you not to be. So when you have a very bad day in sparring, and you're so close to the fight. You have two sparring sessions left. And you have one of them just a horrible day. You've had that. Many, countless times. But there's a way to mentally deal with it. But I'll come back to that later. So when you have a bad day like that, how are you supposed to convince yourself that everything's going to be okay when you've just had enough? Honestly, physically and mentally. And you're not eating what you... You're eating enough, don't get me wrong, but you're not eating what you want, you know, and you're not completely full, of course. But here's the thing about when you're approaching fight week, you have three sparring sessions a week, okay? And sparring is harder than the fight. I'm telling you right now, for anyone who doesn't know boxing, for anyone who doesn't know professional boxing, the sparring is harder than the fight. It's longer shorter rest times you're sparring much more difficult people that want to prove way more than your opponent will want because you you're in the same gym you see each other pretty much every day sometimes you have the same coach so you're fighting for much more you know in that sparring session all that aside you have fight week and then you have the week before is where you have the last week of sparring fight week you don't do much Fight week, your calorie deficit is very low. You're eating very food that weighs so little, so you don't do much training. You're not getting hit. Yeah, it's just no no sparring fight week. The work is done. Cool. So the sparring the week before the fight, so, you know, 90% you will do bad. You will You won't perform in that sparring. Not because you're not ready. Not because you haven't done the work. You could be doing so well during camp, but the week before it's almost over, the week before it's over, the sparring, you probably won't perform. But that's because deep, deep down, there's that pressure of how I'm going to do in the sparring is how I'm going to do in the fight. Mm. Even, even, even if you try to convince yourself, I shouldn't be thinking that way. And if you feel like you've convinced yourself that, you're going to go into the sparring session but in your mental, in your brain, deep down, 
you know that you're judging your sparring based on how you're going to fight. You're judging your fight based on how you're going to spar. It's mental toll. Pat. Exactly. I didn't understand that. So how important is that? So that the last week of sparring it's is... Very, of course, it's, a, it's important because you're, you're sharp. You're, first of all, you're pushing that mental and you're pushing yourself mentally in boundaries where you weren't in throughout the whole of camp because it's the last week, so much pressure and so much doubt and all of that. But the performance, you shouldn't judge, you know, you shouldn't judge your performance in the fight by how you sparred the last week before you end camp because one of them will be very bad. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, 90% of fighters who spar you know, the week before fight week, one of them will be very bad. Maybe two of the three will be horrible even. You know, you won't, they won't be as good as the rest of the camp because the pressure is on, even if you convince yourself. I didn't understand that until I got my mental performance coach <laughs> where he told me, don't judge that week, don't even judge. And even when I'm going into that week and I'm like, you know what, I'm not judging, I still judge because it's so hard not to. But what happens is I'm accepting to the results. If I perform very bad in one of the sparring sessions that week, it's okay. Because I know what my brain is thinking. Yeah. You know, even if I'm not feeling it, I know that deep, deep down, that's what I'm thinking. And it's okay to take that beating today, that loss today. It won't, it won't show, you know, it's not reflective of it doesn't the reflect, yeah, the fight. Doesn't reflect. Yeah. yeah i've had a very hard camp leading up to this fight it was in liverpool the rage on the red sea yeah yeah, okay. yeah. so i always have my camps in la same same thing away from family away from friends away from my country my culture my comfort why because i have no one with me in la disconnect yeah um this is, la is a place of work Nice. LA is a, is a place where... Contrary to how other people might uh, call LA. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> of course. <laughs> LA is a, a place of work that no one ever, <laughs> except the actors. Exactly. But I like that. That also differentiates me from the other athletes who are in the US because they don't have to deal with that. No. They don't have to deal with being away from family, friends, comfort, culture. They only have to deal with being away from friends and sometimes family, but only when they're in camp. I'm in LA regardless of I'm in camp or not. Because like I said, I have to work twice as hard and twice as much to become better, to be even as good. So I'm in LA all year, except Ramadan. I come back. <laughs> I'm here right now because I was lucky to, to fight here. But I'm always there. I'm always away from my family, my friends, and all that comfort. So I deal with much more mentally. So when I heard that the camp was going to be in Liverpool this time, because Callum Smith is also trained by Coach Buddy, and we're both fighting on the Rage on the Red Sea, so we're just gonna have the camp in Liverpool. No jet lag, you don't have to deal with that, so let's have our camp there. I said, you know what, I'm useless. It's nothing new. I've been away from family. I've been in an unfamiliar environment. That's what I thought. I went to Liverpool. I went through everything again. Come on. Because as unfamiliar as I thought LA was to me, it was familiar. So when I went to Liverpool, different people, different vibes, different foods, different everything. Everything's different. So I was completely alone, completely isolated. And then the sparring, and I say that in every interview, every podcast, the sparring in Liverpool was war because they don't know me. They don't see me every day. I'm the new kid at the gym. And I'm fighting on one of the biggest events of the decade. So why are you fighting on that event and not me? You know? So you got a target on your back. Right now, I'm about to show you that I deserve this more than you do. And I should be there more than you, even if they don't want to. But they want to show me anyways. So the sparring was a fight every single time. They went at you. Every sing And I went at them. That's, that's, that's what sparring is. In anywhere, but, but I'm telling you, you extra, exactly. But Ishmaena is the word that comes to mind. Why him? Yeah, exactly. But I don't want to say that they went at me extra because, again, I'm the new face at the gym. Okay, who's a, this? Yeah. a a yeah, and I'm fighting on a very big card, 
So who's this kid who's about to debut on that type of card? And I'm in my second, third fight. I'm about to show him. And they did. Other, <laughs> other fighters thinking that they were you know, way more eligible. Yeah, exactly. And we just went at it. Don't get me wrong. Outside of the ring, we were amazing. Perfect. Because they knew they were helping me. There's respect outside the ring. Huh? There's respect outside the ring. Definitely. And the good thing is they knew that by them giving me that type of work, they're actually helping helping you. So that was the best that's thing. That's how about you it. took it, huh? That's how I took Nothing it. Nothing personal ever. No, no, it's never personal. You can't. Even in the fight. Yeah. Even in the fight. There's a way to do and say everything. You know, you always have to know that there is nothing personal. This is a sport. When it's time to fight, it's time to fight. Maybe it does get personal, but that's the time of the fight. After the fight, there's nothing. Before the fight, there's nothing. Because that's not the time of the fight. But during the fight, I can tell you that... I'm sorry to say it that way. I can't tell you that I give a shit about the person in front of me at all. I don't want to... Of course, I never wish injuries or hurt upon my opponent... Before my fight, when I pray, I pray for my opponent too. You know, really? yeah, of course, of course. You do. It's a, it's a, it's a sport. You're fighting, but you don't want to hurt someone in a way where they wouldn't fight again, or they have to go back home to their parents or whatever. You know, man. you know, he has so, parents too. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. But in Liverpool, they knew by giving me that work. Not only are they proving something. But I also am there to prove something. Yeah. But they're giving me the best work. Yeah. And the guy I was sparring most in Liverpool, he also had a fight a week after I fight. So I knew he has a fight. And I knew the best way to give him the work was to just give him everything I have. And he knew the same. So it was war. War. I cracked my jaw. In sparring? In camp. In camp. Yeah. No way. I cracked my jaw so bad when I'd be eating. And it's not the sore jaw. I, I've been in the sports for long enough to know what a cracked jaw is. When I open my jaw and close, I just hear clicking. Huh? Yeah. And then sometimes when I'm eating, it hurts so bad, my jaw just stops. I can't close it or open it. And I approached the last week, the last two weeks of sparring with a cracked jaw. How long did it take to get back to normal? Is it back to normal now? Yeah, now it's back to normal, of course. But it Fight took, night, was it? Yeah, fight night, it was normal. But the last week of sparring, oh. it wasn't. But... Alhamdulillah, I have a smart coach. He knew what days to deload, what la- what days to go hard. But it's very hard not to go full force the last two weeks of camp. You need to you need to push yourself. Your jaws cracked, protect it. <laughs> Don't get it. Between LA and Liverpool, these two places, like these are like world capitals of of where martial arts boxing mm. is like Liverpool is a is a tough town. It's yeah. you know that Manchester outside of London, like it's, it's, it's a city of fighters. Of, yeah, fighters. Totally. Honestly, I swear totally. The, the, I'll tell the, you the, that. And I'm not even from your world. The, the children, the seniors, fighters. The, everyone is a fighter. Yes. Any gym you'd go to, fighter outside and inside the ring and boxing and combat sports, but any gym you'd go to, all ages. And they're all insane. <laughs> Come here, mate. Yeah. Come here, f- here, mate. Yeah, exactly. I've so, lived in England. I, I know, man. I, so, they, they sound like McGregor a bit, but they're not, yeah, obviously, because he's Irish. Tough people. But tough people. Yeah. Tough people. So you are, you really were like. Pfft. It was the right place to be for a fight of this magnitude. Yeah. That yeah. Was, as, as hard as it, was, as it was, I can't tell you how many times I called my mom telling her, I don't know how, how much longer I could do this. Oh. Or this career is so hard. Really? I can't tell you how many times throughout my, the 12 years I've been doing this what for. What would she say to you? I wanted to speak to you about your parents, but now that you brought it up. Yeah. How does a mom <laughs> advise her son to keep going in a sport where he's being hit in? How? What would she say to you when you're like, I can't take this anymore? Well, my mom would always remind me that I represent so much more than just the boxing. That I'm a symbol to so many people, alhamdulillah. Must be hurting her inside. Yeah, so she she takes pride in that. She That makes her happy. And she knows that whatever makes her and my dad happy, I'm going to keep on doing. Okay. And that's what I mean by I do this for them. The boxing I do for them. The fighting I do for them. Of course I do for myself, but I do it for them more than I do for myself. 
because I've seen how happy they are, how proud they are. And I've seen how much it means to my mom when, you know, I'm a symbol of pride and, you know, hope to so many people, especially in Saudi Arabia and Egypt and the Arab world. So many people thought it couldn't have been done. It couldn't be done. But there's someone who's doing it. So imagine at 20, 21, 22, you already have people looking up to you. You know, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Not me, but, you know, God has put me here. How old are you? Twenty. I just turned 22. Just turned 22. Yeah, alhamdulillah. You look a lot older than 22. <laughs> so my mom... It's she... all the punches you took to the job. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I'm getting older because of the stress, the pressure. <laughs> So yeah, you're my getting mom, stronger. You're not getting older. You're getting yeah, stronger. Exactly, exactly. Yes, sir. My mom, she hears that. She just talks me out of it. Honestly, I don't know how. Talks you, you out know. of it. Yeah, she talks me. No, she talks me out of that thinking oh. of I can't do this anymore. Oh. I don't know how parents do it. I don't know how but mothers. No one knows you better than your mom. Like, no one knows you better. You just asked me that question. In my head, I thought I could give you the answer of how much and how my mom has helped me through my career, but I really can't because I really just don't know how. There is, they have, they, they, <laughs> they operate at different frequency. You know, they, they just say some stuff and do some stuff that hits very different. And so, yeah, my mom just knows exactly what to say and when to say it. And she, you know what, the best thing about my mom and all mothers is they know exactly when to just be silent do you not feel do you not feel as so like moms just know when it's time they know perfectly when it's time to listen yeah and not talk yeah. and when it's time to talk definitely. and advise definitely you know definitely yeah and that's the beautiful thing about mothers they're always there but the dad you know the dad you always look at as a many look at as a superhero you know what i mean but you look at the dad as a superhero because he's not there as much you know a superhero is there when he's needed most he's there at impactful times so for example if spider-man was your neighbor and you'd see him every single day would you think of him as a superhero or would you start thinking of him as your neighbor yeah neighbor so for the people who just think that you know, my dad has been unavailable or he's not there as much as my mom. I don't think that's his job. You know, dad's job is to be the superhero, to be there when and have the most impact. So if you're lucky enough to have both your parents, you should just know that if you'd see your dad every day and talk to him about your problems every day, would he be really would he really be that, <laughs> you know? <laughs> He wouldn't. They pop in, pop in and out of your life. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but mothers, they have something different, man. They have something different. Discipline. Define that word, sir. By the way, I think we took 30 minutes on that last one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Feel free to do the same. Discipline. How would you... What does that word mean to you? Discipline breeds success. Beats, uh, discipline beats success. Breeds. Breeds success. Discipline breeds success. Wow. Yeah. Discipline definitely breeds success because motivation is not going to be there. There's something very weird about motivation. Motivation is only going to be there in the days where you don't need it most. But in the days you need motivation most, it's not going to be there. The thing that's going to be there is discipline. And that's what's going to get you up in the morning. That's what's going to keep you going. But when you start looking for motivation, you don't find it. But when you're not looking for motivation, it's there. I'm motivated to do this and that. That's why I'm doing it. Wow. But the day you wake up and you're like, I don't want to do it. Where's the motivation? I'm looking for the motivation. Nope. Discipline. Discipline beats success some because... Of the, some of the best shit I've ever heard. <laughs> Yeah, discipline wow. breeds success. It shows you how much more important discipline is to motivation. Yeah, and how much more present. Discipline is the mother. Yeah. Motivation is the father. Would you say discipline is um, a choice and motivation is a mood? The way I'm thinking about it, because like, you can't choose to be motivated. So I think it's a mood. Yeah. 
Discipline is like, no, I will be disciplined every day. Yeah, exactly. With motivation, you're like, I just can't be bothered today. But I can't be bothered today. There's no place for discipline there. Which makes me feel that motivation is more of a mood. Well, I'll tell you something. You told me discipline. I told you discipline breeds success. But consistency breeds discipline. So you could tell me that discipline is something you choose. But it's not. Discipline is something that's created Great. with consistency. I wake up every day at the same time, do the same thing, and it gives me result. And I keep doing it and doing it and doing it. That's consistency. So the day that I don't want to do it comes the discipline. No, no, but that's the result you're going to get from it. That's the reason you're doing it for. I need to do it regardless of how I'm feeling. That's discipline. I hear you. So the more disciplined you are and the more consistent you are, the less you'll need motivation and the less it'll have to be there. Mm -hmm. So it's not more of a mood. I think motivation is a starting point. Okay. You know? Got it. When do you feel most alive in your life? When I'm representing others. I feel most alive when... I'm making others proud when I have people looking up to me, when I'm a source of pride, a source of passion, a source of hope. That's when I feel most alive. Boxing gives me that platform. Boxing gives me, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah for everything. But boxing gives me that, that platform of just self-value, self-respect, and Repres representation. Yeah. yeah. I'm representing so much, so much, so, so much. Never take it for granted. The no. list, that, yeah, never. You always and hear about these athletes when they represent their country, World Cup or whatever. They always refer to that, not when they play for mm -hmm. their clubs, when they when they represent yeah, their countries. Exactly. The countries is different. Because you know, when you're representing your country, you're representing your parents, you're representing your roots. The people who, without the people, you wouldn't be there. No. After a lot. Yep. But without the people, you wouldn't be there. No. Without the crowd that night, I wouldn't have won. I'm telling you that right now. You know, without the crowd that night, I wouldn't have gotten that adrenaline that kicks out all the doubt and fear that was creeping in. When I saw the people there, I was like, no way. I need to do this. So, yeah, that's that's where, where I'm most alive. When I'm boxing, when I'm representing my religion, my country, that has given me so much that I'm, I need to give back. When the ref put your hand up, did you get emotional? Did you cry? No, I didn't. What, what was going through you, your head? Just so many years of hard work, hard, hard work that was, you know, just reflected in that minute in that second when he when he raised my hand i just felt like i won everything not just the fight i won so much i won all those years every finally paid off the fights that have gotten cancelled one fight after another after another alhamdulillah god has a plan and it's it's there i'm seeing it so that moment was was something that I have visualized all of fight week. My mental performance coach had me visualizing that moment for so long that when it happened, I was there. I've been there. <laughs> why is this thing anyone's ever told you? And why do I feel that it's something your father told you? <laughs> wow, because it is. <laughs> Not to alienate your mom. Yeah. But I just had a gut feeling that it was a father-son moment. It is. It is. The wisest thing that my dad has ever taught me or told me is to never get emotionally attached to anything or anyone. On your way to success, never, ever get attached to anyone or anything emotionally. If it's a place of work, if it's a co-worker, if it's a coach, if it's on your way to success, you, you, you would be doing them a favor 
if you look after yourself and you don't get too emotionally attached because emotional attachment to place or a person could be the cause of your rise or fall there are two things that that could be the 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 reason for someone's success or failure and he told me the first one is emotional attachment to you know anything or anyone and the other thing is ego so on your way up and once you get there and just throughout your whole journey you need to know that ego could be the thing that will either shoot you to the sky or bury you underground yeah. ego is very bad ego is the enemy when i first went to the us i had to accept someone's better than me i had to accept when i lose i had to accept that maybe i'm not the best but that's pushing my ego aside i have to push my ego aside and my pride aside because once you accept that someone's better than you then you start working to be better than them yeah. once you accept that you've lost you start working to win but if your ego and your pride is there and you're just convinced that i'm the best even though i lost i'm still the best you're you're never going to crawl your way back up maybe you will but not in the way you would have if you put your ego and pride aside mm. so once you're at the tip of the iceberg then what are you going to do to stay there and you have to push your ego and pride aside that's what my dad told me you know it's beautiful emotional attachment and ego could be the rise or fall can't believe you're 22 <laughs> alhamdulillah it's amazing alhamdulillah what kind of people do you avoid is there something that you've seen in people that when you see that they are that they have this specific characteristic you you think to yourself i don't want to associate myself with them i don't avoid anyone i just trust everyone to be who they are <laughs> and i know so i deal with everyone and i'm open and social with everyone it's just i know my limits with every single person So I don't avoid any of them. I just know how much of myself to give to each of them. You need to trust people to be who they are. You need to trust each one to be themselves. You know, you of course you you can't be stupid. You know who's fake, you know who's a doubter, you know who's a naysayer. But don't avoid them. You know, use it to your advantage, but also know your limits. Trust them to be them. you know trust the fake to be fake because as i said earlier in the interview when you expect something it doesn't shock you when it comes so if i know someone is two-faced and someone comes and tells me by the way that person said this about you so what one i don't care about what people think and two i expect it i've i've expected it and i know my limits with that person i've trusted <laughs> them to be them so it's not a shock this person doesn't think you're going to make it or this person says in front of you wow you're so amazing but then behind your back goes and says i don't think you make such good fuel by the way yeah exactly it's fuel. it is it is but just trust people to be them yeah trust people to be who they are you know don't so avoid if someone says shit about you behind your back do you confront or do you Does it not bother you? No, but I don't confront and it doesn't bother me because at 22 you want to go knock him out. But it's because I've learned so, from the people like yourself and like the, you know, the people that you've already seen reach that tip of the iceberg, then you try to see how, how did they do it. Mm. And you'd be very very stupid if you see a quality in someone who's made it and you don't pick it up. So Learn from other people exactly yeah. so when you trust people to be them it doesn't shock you when something happens that you you've expected you expect it so it doesn't shock you when it comes so when someone talks about me behind my back i don't go confront because it doesn't bother me i i i've expected it to happen rise above you know and if i go confront someone about something they said about me whose energy am i wasting yours exactly <laughs> So I could be wasting their energy but I don't care if I'm wasting Cares. their energy. Yeah, At the end of the day I'm going to bear the responsibility. So I'm wasting my energy. 
if I keep thinking about something that someone said when I was sitting with my friends about me, he's going to he's sleeping fine right now. But if I keep thinking about it, I'm wasting my own energy. So just it's what they call living rent free in your head. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Energy that you can use in like training camp, for example. Perfectly While you were said. just on that Perfectly for the last said. five minutes. Um I remember this a very, very powerful saying, which is when someone shows you who they are, believe them. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> it's so good. That's perfect. It's so good. Yeah. Even if it's just once, you know. That's it. Drop mine. Even if it's just once. Believe them. Someone's crossed the line with you just once. Believe it. It's okay. You could be. So, you know, so you have one. I've, I've grown up and I've had, you know, friends. And some of the times you always keep someone in mind, like that specific friend, we would never fight or nothing's gonna, ever going to happen to us, or that person would never talk behind my back. And then one time they go and do so. And then maybe it's, of course, it's going to be a surprise because you don't expect that from, a spe from that specific someone. But once they do it, once they cross, once someone crosses the line with you, if it's a coworker, if it's a significant other, if it's a friend, trust that if they broke that barrier once, they're breaking it again. Yeah. Or even if they don't break it again, it's much easier to break it again. If you're an athlete, for example, or if you're a, if someone you know chasing something, anything. For me, I'll say in my specific experience. I stay away from smoking, I stay away from drinking, I stay away from all of that. Not because of any religious motives or any of that, but because I know it's harmful to my body as an athlete. So people always ask me, wait, but you even haven't, you haven't even tried? No, I haven't tried. I haven't tried any of it because I know that once I try, it's going to be easier to come back. You've been there already. Exactly. And because I know the mental barriers and the mental struggles that athletes go through, I don't want to have something like that as a barrier that I've already opened. Yeah. Because I know I will be, I will hit rock bottom again. And I don't want to That's go true. there as an athlete, especially. It's easier to go back to where you were than to go to where you've never been. Exactly. Wow. <laughs> you summarized it in seconds. It's a Good episode, this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I do say so myself. Emmy nominated that. <laughs> God, this is... Um, what is this? I thought we were going to talk about boxing the whole time. We're talking about life. We didn't life. talk about boxing at all, actually. God. That's the perfect thing. What time is your flight? I have no idea. One th <laughs> but I don't care anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? You said 1.30. I'm just keeping an eye out. It's 11.46. <laughs> Let me know if you're okay for time. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Wow, Zizo, yeah. that's um, that's some weight, man. That is some weight. Anything offend you in life? You know, nothing bothers you in terms of like personality traits, but does anything offend you? What would get Zizo pissed off in any walk, in any situation of life? When the people that you expect to understand you the most don't that's what gets to me okay i Lo feel like lo loyalty thing kind of yeah yeah especially i mean it's like me sitting down and seeing my mom and my dad for example my mother and father when i'm in camp they don't understand what i'm doing regardless of how much information i've given you know what i mean and how much they know about my life so what gets to me is when someone doesn't understand me, regardless of how much of myself I've shown and how much of, you know, my life I've shown. So that gets to me. But honestly, it doesn't get to me that much. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm really focused on just making the people who I want to, who I care about proud. Proud, yeah. And so if it comes from someone that I don't care about from in that specific way, so if it doesn't come from someone that's family, really, I don't really, I don't really care. I don't really let it get to me. You won't lose sleep uh, over it. Yeah, definitely. 
trust. Anyone ever broken your uh, trust? Do you have trust issues with people? I don't have trust issues, but of course, of course, many have broken trust, but you have to expect that from everyone. I'm telling you right now, expect that from everyone, your best friend, your brother, your sister. It's just natural human instinct to talk and to gossip and to have stories to tell. So just expect it to happen. And then when it happens to you, it won't be someone broke your trust. Yeah. You know, just tr- you know, just expect some stuff to happen. Because shit happens. Exactly. And you just got to be able to am- anticipate things because sometimes in life when you uh, really feel that that is impossible, there is no way that will happen. Life will show you hold my coffee let me show you that it will happen <laughs> exactly yeah it will happen exactly uh, and it'll throw you the, the mother of all curveballs yeah <clears throat> anything that you have today that you dreamt of when you were younger everything that i have today i've dreamt of when i was younger like how how far back does it do? actually everything that i have today i wouldn't have dared dream of when i was younger wow you took it another level honestly because who would have thought that a local trained Arab was going to make it this far in international professional boxing? To be with this type of coach around that type of fighters and performing on that type of stage. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, you know, alhamdulillah for everything. It's not me. It's just the path I was chosen to walk. But who would have thought? Not me. <laughs> you know, yeah. I wanted to do it. But I was told by so many people and I was shown around me by so many others in the sport that it wasn't possible. But that just made me want to do it even more. And that gave it so much more value. And so when some when something is given so much value, you want it way more. Yeah. You know, so I wanted it so much more because it was impossible. And here I am, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, it's just the beginning. So inshallah, now I just need to make sure that I do what I'm doing just better and better and better and more and more and more. Because after that win, when all of the hype was happening, Coach Buddy McGirt, my coach, he pulled me aside in that ring and he told me it only gets harder from here. He said, let me tell you something, kid. It's deep. It only gets harder from here. So he put me back in reality. He knew the fans, the people. I've just debuted on a card not anyone debuts on. And the media. And he told me, you were working this hard. You're going to have to work that hard. You were praying this much. Pray that much. Close to God this much. That much. It's not easy being a pro in any sport. You get scrutinized. It's not easy being good at anything. (laughs) You know, it's not easy being good at anything let alone trying to be the best at anything so it's one thing to be the good and the best in your sport and it's another thing to do it in and outside of your sport in and outside of your job who are you who you are outside of your job reflects who you are inside you know what's easy being average yeah definitely look how many of those there are there Definitely. And yeah. they'll come after you. <laughs> they will. Yeah. They'll come after you. You know, the thing is, I I find it very hard to, to say that, you know, just when it's a sit down of me and you, because the, you have to have that art of humbleness. You know what I mean? But the thing about humbleness is humbleness does not exist in your field of work. You need to understand that. Everybody needs to understand that. That humbleness is only to the people who have nothing to do with your field of work, who are not involved. Be humble to supporters, mom, dad, brother, you know, grandmother. Be humble with those people. Could you win? Could you beat this guy? Could you beat that guy? I don't know. You know, inshallah, I will. Only Allah can decide. I will try my best. But once someone from your work from your field of work comes and asks that same question you have to give it to them head on 
because there is no humbleness there is no kindness everyone is looking for the best for themselves so you need to know that when i have someone from my gym who could come and just even if they're joking there is no joking in it come on zizo let me give you a few rounds let me push you around a little bit no you know what let's do it <laughs> you know what i mean because i could beat you even if even if i can't i have to say that i can yeah. because once i say it it just puts me at a at another level that i'm humble to those outside of my work but inside of my work there is no humbleness could you beat this guy yeah i could beat this guy i don't think you could beat me of course i could beat you you know what am i here for mm. if i'm not thinking that way if i'm not thinking that i could beat you if i'm not thinking that i'm better than you or i will be or i will beat you then why am i here i shouldn't be here the guy in sky sports after the public workout asked me what are your aspirations to be a world champion what do you think to be a world champion and i said if you're not in the sport to be a world champion you're in the wrong sport cuz you it's going to demand so much so when he asked me that that's a guy from my field of work confidence comes from god and confidence comes from preparation so i was confident i had to let it go cuz i had to announce myself yeah. to the sport but if someone outside asks me that tell him inshallah inshallah i'll try my best if it happens it happens if it doesn't it doesn't you know have you been told before that you have a good head on your shoulders <laughs> wise beyond your years because no. you speak like a 30 year old plus someone <laughs> that has seen a little bit more than I'm not saying you haven't seen but like a 22 you we are a bit more reckless when i was 22 i was a reckless freak show alhamdulillah into yeah it looks like you've studied people who have come before you a lot that's that's the only way yeah. to do it yeah you know you my dad that. always told me that i always have to have an idol in my field and who was it muhammad ali muhammad ali of course muhammad ali was my idol mm -hmm. because of how he was outside of the ring and inside of the ring yeah. muhammad salah <laughs> muhammad salah has to be an idol because again so of what he's doing outside and inside broke so many barriers yeah and then and then broke so many barriers with so many people saying he can't So that's the beautiful thing about it, you know. So when you idolize someone and and you start idolizing their attributes, their personality, the way they talk, the way they speak, the way they deal with people, you start doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. You start talking the way they do, mm -hmm. dealing with people the way they do, you know. So the worst thing is to walk with the worst thing to do is to walk with a chip on your shoulder. That is the worst you know no matter how far you make it, no matter what background you come from what family you come from don't ever walk with a chip on your shoulders because the rules could be reversed any any day any time and i promise you you will gain so much more love and respect from so many people once you give them so much more to relate with so just make them feel like you know we're all one we all do the same thing and i'm doing this for all of us mm -hmm. so that's what that's the message i'm trying to give in boxing you know so yeah having an idol is definitely the only way to do it so i clocked a boxer who fought in the same mm -hmm. uh, fight that you mm -hmm. fought in Rage on the Red Sea and in the press conference i clocked him and i felt that referring to what you just said chip on your shoulder i'm like that guy has a chip on his shoulder Yeah, you're going to see it and you're going to know it. But this one specific guy <laughs> and like, you know, whatever, maybe that's just the way you carry yourself, that's how yeah. you try to get into your opponent's head, but I felt a lot of just in you know, I am the shit. And ended up losing. Um and and now I see why you say you don't want to have that. Uh Popeye. Yeah. Oh, Popeye. <laughs> I don't know him. I thought he was Saudi. He wore a toba That's in the what thing. I thought too. <laughs> and he has this thing and has that. And hey, whatever works for you. Maybe it worked for you in the past. But I felt and saw the chip on his shoulder. Yeah. I was like, anyone who's going to walk around with a pipe and a hat, uh, you know, is, is not going to lose. Yeah. <laughs> But, you know, 
the more you give people to relate to you with, yeah. the more love and respect you'll have from them. Yeah. So the more down to earth. Exactly. Exactly. So when you're in this sport, when you're in any sport or any job, but mm. for me, when I'm in boxing, the more I give my supporters something to relate to me with, the more yeah. love I'll get. Yeah. Muhammad Ali, that. down to earth. Exactly. Exactly. A man of the people. Yeah. That's why I had on the back of my job, I said the people's champ. People's champ, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, and that's how I really felt, especially that night. And he made a name for himself in the U.S. at a time where it wasn't cool to support the black man. Mm -hmm. 60s and 70s, Martin Luther King days, mm -hmm. civil rights movement. Yeah. And look at how everyone talks and remembers him, even before his death a few years ago. Yeah. He was an icon. An icon, you know, I'm very, I'm very close with God. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. you know, so I like my prayers, mm, treat, keeping my parents happy. I never upset my parents, no matter what. Mm. If they told me to drop boxing right now, I'm dropping it because I know I will never succeed at it with them not being happy with it. So I'm, I always pray. I always keep my parents happy. I always stay in touch with my family you know the 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 important things and every day i pray to god to just have something that no one has reached and have something that no one can reach something like muhammad ali you know what i mean this guy did something where if he's a brand it's a brand you go and ask anywhere if they know boxing or don't they know who muhammad ali was yeah Mike Tyson, same thing. They know boxing or they don't. They know who Mike Tyson is. They yes. could they could know Mike Tyson. They do they they could know Mike Tyson and not know what he's what he's done. Muhammad Ali, same thing. Sport royalty. Yeah. Now, one of the final questions that I normally have is uh, if you were to go back and have a conversation with your eighteen year old self, what would uh, what would you tell them? But I won't because that was only four years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I was just about to say, <laughs> well, I could probably remember a conversation I had with myself. <laughs> sure, it felt like yesterday. Uh, if you can go back and have a conversation with Ziad, the 10-year-old, okay? 10-year-old, mm -hmm. eight, 10-year-old. Uh, is there a piece of advice that you would tell him to do or do not do now knowing what the future unfolded for young Ziad? I tell him two things. The first one is to not be too kind. Because people take advantage of that kindness. Kindness for weakness. Yeah. So never be too kind. Just work on not being too kind. And then correlating with it is to trust people to be them. Trust people to be themselves. You know them. Don't ignore it. Just trust them to do what you know them to do you know trust them to do what their personality is trust them to be them because once you trust them to be them you know your limitations with everyone so you know exactly how kind to be with everyone and who you demand respect from and who you set your limits with and who you're more lenient with and stuff because once you know someone's personality just trust Trust them to act on it. So it's an interpersonal thing, how you treat the people around you. Yeah. Uh, be mindful of the energy you spend on person A, B, mm -hmm. C. That's what you would want to find. You. Yeah. yeah. And of course, surround people, surround yourself by people who you want to be like, or surround yourself by people who have the same goals and aspirations as you do. For example, fight week, I had one of my friends who is a editor. He's a TikToker. He's very big uh, in the Arab world. And he has almost a million followers now. I love how that's become a profession. He's a TikToker. And, yeah. I, and I understood it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But honestly, he, he is like an amazing editor. And so he knows the hours that he needs to spend editing. And he knows the sacrifices that he needs to make, sacrifices from friends, from family, because he does what he's doing in the U.S. And then he knows what it means to just deal with the pressure. So I had him with me fight week, not because he's a childhood best friend. 
but more so because the days where I needed to be pushed, he would push me. I had another one of my friends too, so my other friend could push me. He knew he would know when he'd need to push me, but my editor friend, his name is Mustafa, Mustafa Hassan, and but Mustafa would know how much to be pushed, I needed to be pushed. pushed. Yeah, yeah. So it's one thing to know when someone needs to be pushed, and it's another to know when and how much that person needs to be yeah. pushed, you know? So that was a key role for him fight week. He knew that the day where I just didn't have it in me, I couldn't run, no energy, I'm losing too much weight fight week. And that's where you could win or lose, the win or, or loss exactly. could be hinging exactly. on how much did I push or take yeah. my foot off him so during camp. He knew not only when to push, but how much, how much because he understands do. it yeah. he's been there he's not a fighter but surround yourself by the people who have the same dreams same aspirations same goals want to break boundaries represent country family yeah. so if you surround yourself by the same mentality the time you need that mentality when yours isn't there it's going to be there so consistency breeds Everything. discipline discipline breeds success uh. I'll go a step further, uh, something I'm pretty sure you heard, uh, which is you are the average of the five people closest to you, mm -hmm. which really makes you forensic going forward with who you spend your time with. Yep. When I heard that, I was like, wow, Definitely. I'm the average of the five people I spend my, most of my time with. Okay, maybe I need to be hanging around this guy a little less. Maybe I need to be hanging around this guy a little bit more mm -hmm. um, because I've, <laughs> it makes sense. Because it's it's the information you're getting, it's the people who you're talking to, it's yep. your source for many things, and I and I believe that that yep. you yep. are the average of the five people closest. To you. Yeah, there's that Arabic saying, or so much like so many people say, it, I don't know where, but they say, "Tell me who your friends are, I'll and I'll tell, tell you who you are." Yeah, I'll tell you who your what your future is. Yeah, yeah. tell me who yeah. your friends yeah. are, and I'll tell you what your future is. Yeah, <sighs> oh, God damn. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wow. What are your plans going forward the next five years or so? Forget five years. <laughs> For the rest of this year in 23, uh, what's in the pipeline? Inshallah, I want to fight before the year ends. I I'm trying to get a fight in December, inshallah. But any time before the year is good. I want to fight one more time before the year ends, then go back December, enjoy my family, my parents. And then that's just... The most important thing is to understand that, alhamdulillah, God gave me a platform that's here. And so I need to stay here. And I need to work as hard as I can and just do the same thing I was doing, just <laughs> this much better to stay up here, not to go down again. Just keep that, keep that you know, line trending. And that's what I want to do. Inshallah, I want to just get another win before the end of the year, represent the country better and better internationally. Whatever opportunity is open, I'll jump right on it. But inshallah, yeah. I love how hungry you still are. Uh, even though you got <laughs> that one, like you're still, it meant like you celebrated it, but yeah. you're, you're looking forward constantly. Because I was speaking to my mom, I said, I've been through so much, so much maybe we didn't even talk about today, but it it truly does haunt me <laughs> what I've been through in the sport leading up to the level I'm at now. Is there something that we didn't discuss that you want to just point out? No, 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 no. We've, we've discussed okay, we've, plenty. <laughs> yeah. No, but I'm sure, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a but, cutthroat. But in terms of the, the career, you know, the... <laughs> it's cruel. Exactly. It's cruel. It's cruel. And I've lost so much. I've sacrificed so much. You could see it in your eyes. Yeah, time with family, with friends in in the country, you know. So, yeah, you sacrifice, sacrifice a lot. And it, word, and, it, yeah, yeah. It, and it haunts you sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Took the word out of my mouth. Yeah, it just haunts you sometimes. But I was talking to my mom. I said, all that and alhamdulillah, God led me to this stage. But I feel so that he didn't lead me to the stage just so I perform and I deliver and I get the result. But he's led me to the stage to see how I'd react when I finally have 
what I've been asking for. Mm. So how are you going to react when you finally get to what you've been praying for? Mm. Are you going to keep praying to what you've been working for? Are you going to keep working to what you've been fighting for, pushing for, sending your message out for? Are you going to keep doing all that stuff, but much more exaggerated? You need to take it to the next step. Because once you reach one step, the next step is is higher up. Higher and up. so yeah. do you need to be. So yeah, boxing has taken so much out of me, <laughs> but has given me so much in return that I can't let go of the sport. Alhamdulillah, this is the beginning. Amazing. You know, can you imagine? Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, this is the beginning. So inshallah, I keep doing it for the country, for, for my parents and for myself as so... I like that. I like that you included yourself. Of course, you're making the country. Yeah. Of course, you're family. <laughs> but I, I'm glad that you, uh, in your very selfless manners, mannerisms, <laughs> you you mentioned yourself. It's um, yeah. it's huge. It's been. I want to. I yeah. want to thank you. Oh. <laughs> Honestly, for what you did for us, uh, what you did no, for yourself, thank you, you made you made a thank nation you, proud, Allah, thank a, a nation that, that that boxing is so unhistoric, and you have now, you know, put one in the history books. That's that that's, we have a boxing representation, twenty-two year old, and who's to guess where this can go? But you have a really good head on your shoulders, and you know, if you were a stock, I would invest in you. <laughs> You having me here is you investing. Allah, you having me here and the support that I've seen from the people, that I've seen from His Royal Highness, the Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, Prince Abdulaziz bin Turk Al Faisal, Prince Khalid, Prince Fahad, Princess Mashal. I've just seen so much love, you know, and I just hope to keep doing it. Keep empowering that 2030 vision keep empowering my vision <laughs> for for the country for my family for mm -hmm. the people but what i've seen what i saw the last few months and the support and the media and all the ministries working together to support me and to put my name out there i i, I couldn't have never imagined it to be like that and how can a kid see that and not be more hungry and not want more and want to give more because I owe so much more now. I've already owed more, but I've already owed so much, but now I owe so much more. So I have to keep going. Not for me, but for everyone else. Well, you know, it's reciprocal. They wouldn't be behind you if they didn't see value in you. They wouldn't be behind you if they, think that if they didn't, if they weren't proud of you. Um, and it's uh, it's 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 a win win. You bring something to the table, and and for that they will support you. Exactly. Um, and I, and actually, I've said that on a few episodes that if you are if you become one of the best in what you do, it won't be long until a federation under the sport that you practice will reach out to you and push you. Exactly. Keep pushing. Stay on the road. Send your DMs. Send your messages. Send the emails. Mm -hmm. Find the best managers the federations, find everyone that's the best in the field you want to be and send your CV. Put, put yourself out there. Put yourself out yeah. there because if you send it to 100 people and 99 people don't reply and one replies, you've gained it's, so it's much. Huge, yeah. It's what they call cold calls. Yeah. What did we talk about before we started this? What did I tell you? I said that if I didn't drop exactly. cold calls, yeah. be a, a, a call where I put myself out there, try to get someone on the show or or DMs on Instagram, and I've done that a lot. <laughs> yeah. If I didn't do that, I'd be at maybe 25 episodes today exactly. and not 68. Yeah, and I told so, you I wouldn't be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't be here. So that's just how it is. And you'd be surprised that the one person who will reply back to you is the person who knows most about the field you're there you working go. in. There you go. Because they yeah. know exactly what they see. Yeah. Put yourself out there. Yep. And you shall surface. Inshallah. Thanks, Habibi. Thanks so much, man. Thank you. I'm so what sorry I kept episode. you for a long... Uh, what an episode. <laughs> I don't even care about my flight, man. I'm going to go there and see what flight is, is, is there for the taking. <laughs> you said 1.30? Yeah. Yeah? No, you'll make it to the airport in time. It's 12.30. You to go. I'll see you guys Thank next you time. so much. Amazing. <laughs> Way more than I thought. Habibi. I love it. Thanks so much, Cesar. Thanks. Such a champ. Thank you.